thanks for joining us for our presentation on strategies and techniques for managing complex wounds using negative pressure wound therapy. My name is Dot Weir. I'm one of the speakers along with Dr. Roslovsky. These are our disclosures. This is a presentation that's provided by HMP Education and supported by an independent educational grant from 3M Healthcare. So these are our objectives. We're basically going to look at the landscape of negative pressure wound therapy, and then look at cases that help to illustrate the use of negative pressure in all kinds of wound types across different care settings. So with that uh, set up, let's go ahead and get started. As I said, my name is Dot Weir. <clears throat> I am a wound care nurse. I practice at Saratoga Hospital Center for Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Medicine in Saratoga Springs, New York. So let's begin by looking at some facts. I'm not going to go over every single thing on this slide, but the bottom line is there are a lot of wounds out there, like over 8 million people in the United States have some sort of a wound either with or without an infection. And then you just can on down on some of these bullet points. It's a ridiculously costly problem in the U.S. healthcare market. Uh, the treatments range all the way up to nine, over $96 billion. Um, the product market itself is supposed to reach $22 billion by 2024. And, you know, we, we have a lot of healthcare costs. A lot of hospitals, especially after the pandemic, are sort of bleeding money, um, we, we have older folks that we're taking care of, sicker folks that we're taking care of, and it's all led to very high costs and a lot of challenges. When we look at the types of wounds that we take care of, there, there are the com most common ones that we mostly see, the venous leg ulcers, which represent probably the largest percentage of most outpatient practices. Um, they're easy to treat if you can get them compressed and have a, have a, uh, a healthier patient, uh, but they do recur quite frequently. The challenge with venous leg ulcers is the drainage, and the fact that because of the wraps and the things that people have to use, it's estimated that there are sometimes over 4 million work days lost in the US every year due to venous ulcer disease. With the diabetic foot ulcers, we know, of course, those are a big problem, especially with the diabetes and the obesity problem that we have now. And I think the most staggering uh, statistic that I most recently read is if you take a person who has diabetes and one that has an ulcer and one that doesn't have an ulcer, the one that has the ulcer is two and a half times um, more likely to die because as a result of that. And so again, uh, you can see these exorbitant costs in the care of these kinds of patients. Additionally, pressure injuries occur in so many patients, almost two and a half million patients in the U.S. And then there's everything else. We see a tremendous number of very atypical wounds in our, in our practice, uh, which, which I'll talk about again in just a second. So when we look at identifying these patients, the most important thing we can do up front is to identify the etiology and then treat and support that etiology. <clears throat> if we have a patient with a venous leg ulcer, then we need to compress them. If we have a person with a diabetic foot ulcer, you know, it said you can put anything on that ulcer and it'll heal except for the patient. So we need to make sure we're offloading. Certainly contact casting is the gold standard, but a lot of folks can't have casting for a variety of reasons. So we need to find some other type of offloading for them. With pressure injuries, of course, we're going to take the pressure off and we want to make sure that whatever skin lesion that we're looking at is actually a pressure injury and not some other sort of etiology such as moisture associated skin damage. With our arterial patients, we try to get them revascularized. If not, we try to help protect, especially their lower legs and feet uh, in every way that we possibly can. And then at the bottom, what you'll see is just a cut several different types of wounds that are more classified as atypical. You're looking at scleroderma. Uh, this next one you're <clears throat> looking at is a skin cancer. Um, this is a skin cancer, uh, several of them in a row. Um, this patient was uh, a malignant melanoma, and she had had that on her leg for a couple of years, afraid to go to the doctor because of what it might be. And then uh, this is the patient that had the worst case of vasculitis that we've ever seen. So uh, the important thing that we want to make sure that we do is have a low threshold for biopsy and uh, make sure we don't need to be treating this wound with surgery uh, and or some sort of um, systemic medication. So with that said, 
We know how humans heal. We know that there uh, are four overlapping phases. Well, hemostasis is an event. And then three more phases of overlapping wound healing phases, proper inflammation, good proliferation where we grow back in that new tissue with granulation tissue and then ultimately epithelialize. And then once the wound is closed, we know that there's a remodeling process that has to go on for several months to a couple of years. And so this is how we expect to heal. What we see in chronic wound care though, of course, are those that are the unexpected patients who have open wounds that they didn't expect to have an outcome that they didn't expect to have. And it's a very daunting journey that we go on with these patients and we have a lot that we can do to help them. And so it may beg the question, where does negative pressure fit into all of this? Well, if we go back and look at these wounds on this uh, slide that I just showed you, every single one of them were treated with negative pressure wound therapy. And when I talk about a daunting journey, some of these are quite old patients. I don't mean they're older, but I took care of them many years ago. That bottom left one, was from 2000, around 2004, but I remember their stories. I remember the struggles that they had as we treated these wounds. And again, we treated them all with negative pressure wound therapy. So let's look at that. Negative pressure wound therapy is, is not a new uh, type of treatment. As you'll see, it's in its third decade of use. We understand the, ne the mechanism of action. Um, both of this doctor and I will both mention this. So we know that there's a, an open wound. We have an interface dressing of some kind attached to a port that leads to some sort of a suction device. And it's a negative pressure, subatmospheric pressure. And so we think of it as something that will pull that fluid away. And indeed it does. It also pulls the wound edges together. That's called macro deformation. And as Dr. Wyslowski will point out, uh, we also have an interface of the foam, and I'm gonna show you another picture of this also, that interacts with the surface of the wound itself. And he'll show you a really good diagrams of how that works. But the whole goal is that we're optimizing that wound bed to promote wound healing. Also, of course, we're dealing with exudate with so many of these wounds, and we know the challenges with exudate, the skin problems, the maceration, erosion and pain. Uh, and then there's the huge quality of life issues, uh, odor, uh, soiling of their clothing, soiling of their bed linens. Uh, and we have good dressings that can appropriately absorb product or exudate. But if you look at that top right picture, even though that's a good absorbent product, it didn't pull it enough away to keep it off of the skin. So we still have maceration and we still have erosion. Uh, so we, you know, and then also it begs that, you know, they need to have frequent dressing changes then and sets the cost of the dressings is there. Patients oftentimes cannot qualify for home care because they, they say are not homebound. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, uh, may not have somebody in their home that's able to do their dressing changes for them. So the actually challenges are real. Negative pressure wind therapy is commonly thought of as, as a suction device to suction out drainage. It is in its third decade of use. We've all been using it for a long time. It's been multi, uh, studied across multiple care settings, and it does do a very good job of, of managing exudate. And I will point out, and again, we'll talk about this again, but uh, when we look at uh, the negative pressure, the sweet spot of negative pressure is really in the foam. When we look at how the, that, that it works, as the foam compresses down, what you're looking at is a cross section of the foam and that all those little openings and cells within the foam are interrelated. So as that compresses down, the little struts that are at the base of that foam are going to be able to uh, touch the wound bed, stretch the cells, and further cause uh, uh, good granulation tissue to form. Now, uh, we know the root of all evils in many of our wounds is edema. And if you just look at that dress, that wound that's right there, you can see it's continuously dripping. And so we've already talked about the issues that we see with exudate. And so the other problem that we have with some of these is surface perfusion, oxygen perfusion. And so when you look at the little diagrams at the bottom, that left hand box that's showing normal tissue. When you have no edema in the tissue, the capillaries are closer together. So the distance that uh, oxygen has to travel in order to, uh, to, to perfuse the tissues is lessened. 
Uh, when you have a lot of edema in the tissues, those capillaries are farther spread out. And so the distance that oxygen has to uh, travel or the distance diffusion is increased. So when we take that peri wound edema out, certainly we're going to manage edema with a, say a compression wrap, but when we take that peri wound edema out, then we reduce the distance diffusion and improve the perfusion to the wound bed. So we have lots of lots of things that we can use, both how we approach our tr uh, wounds in terms of how we can debride them and clean them up. Uh, we have various types of negative pressure that we have. Uh, depending on the site of care, we have the options of using. We have multiple advanced dressings that are available. Uh, including things like collagen. Um, and we have our compression therapy that we've already talked about. And then we have cellular and tissue-based therapies, which are very commonly used. But of course, anytime we're using something like that, we have to make sure we're putting it onto a well-prepared wound bed. And that's, again, where negative pressure wound therapy can come into play. So there's a variety now of different kinds of pumps that are on the market. There's the larger ones that are used in the hospital settings uh, that are either the standard types of pumps or some that can are able to infuse fluid in, are more portable types of pumps that you see here. And then we have the <clears throat> disposable types of devices that deliver uh, negative pressure wind therapy and underneath a, a, an advanced dressing. And I'll show you some cases with that. So the indications are pretty much all the different kinds of wounds that we take care of, all of our chronic and acute wounds, uh, burns, uh, partial thickness wounds anyway, different kinds of ulcers, flaps, and then grafts. So we have a pretty much an uh, option to use negative pressure on most of the wounds that we take care of. So there's some common misconceptions though. We, a lot of people think we use negative pressure when um, other modalities have failed or on just super large or cavernous wounds only. But the reality is, is that small wounds can be just as troublesome as large wounds. So size doesn't really matter when it comes to choosing negative pressure wound therapy. It's really what it's going to do for that wound. So with that all set up, let's talk about, let's take some patient journeys with some of my patients. The first one is a lady who had just recently moved to the Saratoga Springs area. Uh, she came to live closer to her daughter. She had multiple sclerosis, um, had been in a wheelchair for some number of years. She also had a neuropathy of her legs, so didn't have a lot of feeling in her legs. While she was trying to pack herself up, she dropped a box on her leg and it called an avulsive injury to her lower extremity, which she just managed with some dressings during the moving process. She had adequate perfusion and it really didn't cause her any pain. So one of the things that we were dealing with with her, not only is an open wound, but also dependent edema because she was in a wheelchair. So you can see where we started. We uh, packed her with a gelling fiber dressing and a silicone um, uh, foam dressing and put her into a three layer wrap to help reduce some of the volume. And she came back a few days later and the wound is a little smaller. She still has undermining, but she was tolerating the wrap very well. So just under two weeks in, we decided to now to convert her because of the undermining and the size of the wound to a mechanically powered negative pressure wound therapy to be continued uh, to use underneath our two layer compression wrap. <clears throat> By two weeks in, you can see just after a couple of days of the negative pressure, the wound bed is improved. It looks more granular. Um, and then you'll just see as we went on through these days, um, that her undermining was dramatically reducing and the size of her wound was reducing. <clears throat> and then uh, about a month in, a little over a month in, the undermining was resolved, her wound was improving. So we stopped the mechanically powered negative pressure, <clears throat> went to a collagen dressing and uh, underneath the two layer wrap. And you can see by just a couple of months in, uh, her wound was completely closed. This is another type of patients that we see fairly frequently, I would say, a 41-year-old guy who has had a six-year history of hydradenitis suppurativa, which is an inflammatory and infectious process involving the um, sweat glands. Um, and structures in the skin. He had had multiple surgeries because of infections. And so he underwent a very wide excisional operative debridement. Uh, he did have diabetes, but no other significant medical history. And so on this, on this day after his debridement, we started negative pressure wound therapy. 
So what you can see is that after 17 days of negative pressure, his wound is very robust looking, healthy granulation tissue, well prepared. He had a split thickness skin graft and that middle picture is only four days after that graft. And then uh, prior to <clears throat> um, uh, that, we used other things to bolster skin grafts down. But I think for a large skin graft, there's nothing that beats uh, negative pressure wound therapy. So we stopped the negative pressure uh, at that visit. And this uh, far right picture picture shows his graft at nine days. That's an amazing take for that kind of um, size of a graft, but also in that location. And then he had his right groin explored similarly, had a wide excision. Uh, we used negative pressure on there also in order to uh, um, uh, improve the wound bed and get it prepared for the graft. He had a split thickness skin graft that was four days post graft. And then the one on the right is eight days post graft. Again, an amazing take for uh, that area of the body and that size of a graft. So this was a more recent patient. We have a 61 year old guy who had had a leukemia in the past. He had anemia and thrombocytopenia secondary to that. He had some vascular issues and some uh, coronary artery issues, was a di had diabetes. So he had had his right great toe amputated. And he, it, his surgery was done by a podiatrist that was sort of out of our area. Um, his wound had opened up a couple of weeks after his surgery. This was his first visit to us. And as we cleaned him up and explored the wound, he did um, probe down to the exposed metatarsal head. So he didn't have any overt signs of infection, but we sent him back to his surgical podiatrist for, uh, to, to uh, re redo that wound and to do a good OR debridement. So he returned to us three months later uh, with a right first ray that he had, had um, amputated more of that bone, as well as he had had a transmetatarsal amputation on the left-hand side. So the, the um, uh, podiatrist in his local area had begun to use cellular and tissue-based products and uh, had been using the negative pressure wound therapy. And uh, this time was we were using a negative pressure where it had a silicone, sort of a hybrid silicone acrylic drape. And then interestingly, we were why connecting them both together. So if you look at uh, the, the two left-hand panels are his um, ulcers, his wounds on his first visit back to us. The dark coloring in that top one is really dried up cellular and tissue based products. So before we put negative pressure back on, we debrided that away. And this mesh looking graft here is also one of the CTPs. So these are both of his, uh, his right foot and his left transmet, again, with negative pressure um, and then using the hybrid drape. And then this is his uh, um, uh, device with both feet why connected to the same device. And he did really well, believe it or not, he walked with that walker um, very, very carefully. So then uh, we, he wasn't coming to us at, for every dressing change. He came back uh, about a month later. He had been getting care in the home and with his uh, other podiatrist. And so the left-hand panels are where we started when we first saw him. Uh, one month later, you can see the, the, the transmit is much cleaner. The, um, the right foot um, uh, ray resection is certainly getting smaller and healthier looking. And then the last one is two more months. This was his final visit with us. We cleaned up those wound edges and he was going to be followed by his local podiatrist. Now, these are a couple of other examples of using <clears throat> um, negative pressure wound therapy in, in a rather unusual way. This gentleman was the owner of a golf course, 71 years old. He had a venous leg ulcer on that right leg. He had had a FEMPOP bypass. We were able to use two layer compression. His bigger challenge was that upper thigh wound. He had known lymphedema. I think you can appreciate the differences in the sizes of his two legs. And it, it was like a lymphatic leak. And so, the picture at the bottom is uh, before we started negative pressure and the one at the, uh, the next one is afterwards. And so what we did was we used the mechanically uh, powered, the off the shelf disposable um, with uh, that thigh wound. We changed it just three times over six days and it sealed off that lymphatic leak and uh, that wound was done. And then we went on to continue to treat that venous leg ulcer.
This is another example of a very similar <clears throat> situation, a 75 year old lady. She had had a lipoma removed from the left side of her, like between her, her neck and her shoulder. And uh, she also had what seemed to be a lymphatic leak. She was pouring fluid out of this uh, small open wound that was um, uh, quite deep. Uh, it was two and a half centimeters deep. So we put a small piece of foam in there, used the mechanically powered hydrocolloid dressing. Uh, and then it, her exudate uh, went down in two weeks to minimal, from copious to minimal. And then she did go on to completely close. Now, why is this one called Superwoman? Because that's what I think of this girl. She's actually still a current patient of ours, 38 years old, obese. She is a mother of three, but what makes her a superwoman is she has one two-year-old autistic daughter who's quite active and adorable. And then she has two tiny twin boys. So she's very familiar with negative pressure because she's had two C-sections that both dehissed and she had negative pressure uh, all used on that. Now she's status post pilonidal cyst excision, and she doesn't really have any health issues, but she is significantly sensitive to most adhesives. And so the picture on the left is when we first saw her, uh, she, <clears throat> um, you can see the size of her wound. It was seven centimeters deep. She was undermined five centimeters circumferentially. So this is quite a wound. And we were using a gelling fiber with an absorbent foam. So two weeks later, uh, she's got help from her husband doing her dressing at home. She has a little bit of a rash. So we crusted her skin and began negative pressure wound therapy using that hybrid silicone acrylic drape. And that drape was perfectly fine on her skin, even though she has significant sensitivities. At day 12, you can see she's, uh, her undermining is already resolved. She's got, uh, her depth is down from seven to four centimeters. And then on day 42, it's uh, again, very much smaller. And at this point, and this was just last week, at this point, we switched her over to the mechanically powered system. So it just swings, out. We uh, obviously this is at a pilonidal cyst, but she can just bring it around, put the uh, cartridge into her pocket, and then has both hands and both shoulders free to be able to deal with those very, very active children. So the, the last patient, I think, is uh, really just looking at the creativity that we can use when we're using negative pressure wound therapy. And these last two cases are all both using the mechanically powered one. This is a gentleman from several years ago who was in my practice in Florida, and he had an abscess between his toes. You can see that it's 4.4 centimeters deep, and he has all five toes. So this was a very small area uh, that we had to work with. So her skin on the bottom of his feet were very, very calloused and crusty. So we used a curette to smooth out that skin. We used a hydrocolloid ring around the actual opening itself. Um, after putting some uh, skin prep down, we put a piece of, uh, of um, film dressing on the dorsum of his foot there. We cut the foam as like a little dart. We were able to get it a couple of centimeters, three centimeters down into that track. Then we laid it down on top of his foot and then used a bridge type of dressing to attach to the foam and some pieces of uh, vac drape but here. Uh, um, acrylic drape to seal that between his toes. And then this was the end result. We caught it the flip-flop dressing. This is the Florida flip-flop dressing. And because he had some edema, we also uh, used compression therapy over that. So the wound uh, healed quickly in three weeks time. We could see the base. Remember he had over four centimeters of uh, depth before. At four weeks, we uh, put on a um, cellular and tissue based products. And at eight weeks, I believe it was, he was completely closed. So that was my Florida flip-flop dressing. This next gentleman, <clears throat> again, is 51 years old, diabetes. He had had a second toe amputated. And because of some situations in his home. He did not want nurses coming in. It had to do with his father. And so he was attempting to do his own care, was not doing able, doing well because of his body habitus. It was hard for him to reach. You can see that the measurements were what they were, but he were, he were able to probe down to bone and his wound bed was, was very unhealthy looking. So we were stuck with a dilemma of not him not being able to change dressings and not wanting home care nurses. So we began to use uh, the mechanically powdered negative powered negative pressure wound therapy because we weren't getting anywhere. And so you can see his wound when we started, 
Um, he, uh, the one on the right is after just two dressing changes, you see improvement in his tissues. Um, after six weeks, uh, he, we were having a little bit of maceration problems, but the wound was getting a little smaller. The bone was now covered up. And the one on the right is uh, the dressing in place. That's what we call our New York flip-flop dressing, um, even though it was the middle of winter, because this he is also still a current patient. So in closing, you know, life goes on, patients have needs, and we have the options to utilize, especially negative pressure wound therapy, to get wounds prepped up faster, and to get wounds closed faster. So patients can continue on with their life. And, and then while we're um, using negative pressure wound therapy, again, we have options if someone's going to school, if somebody has to work, if they're going through therapy, and we don't want to use the powered systems that um, they wear on their shoulders, then we have the option to using the more disposable types and uh, making their quality of life improved while we're treating their wound. So in closing, we started out my part of this session talking about costs and some of the exorbitant costs. And I don't know if you're familiar with the triple aim concept in healthcare. It was in response to healthcare reform back in 2010. And the triple aim concept or theory is to improve clinical outcomes, you do so at a lower cost of care and still have good increased patient satisfaction. And, you know, these patients that we take care of are very complicated. They're sick. We have financial, regulatory quality issues and legal issues that we have to contend with. And so nothing's really easy when it comes to taking care of these folks. So we want to practice evidence-based care. And I believe that utilizing negative pressure wound therapy really gets us closer to meeting the, uh, the triple aim needs. We can improve their clinical outcomes. We can do it in a cost-effective way. And we have absolutely have increased patient satisfaction. So with that, I appreciate you spending time with me today. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Rolotsky. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us in today's lecture. The topic of today's lecture is strategies and techniques for managing complex wounds using negative pressure wound therapy. My name is Dr. Philip Ritzlowski. I'm the director of the Advanced Foot and Ankle Center of San Diego, California. And today we will be discussing strategies for complex wounds, particularly focusing on negative pressure wound therapy. <laughs> Prior to the discussion, it's always an important idea to talk about the basics of wound care. While negative pressure is a vital aspect of wound care therapy, one needs to understand their basics and be able to communicate with the patient the basics because there are really two players in this. There's the doctor that's providing the care, but the patient's understanding of the care that they're getting. If the patient is not on board and they don't understand why the doctor and nurse is doing what they're doing, then it's harder for them to be compliant and harder for them to buy into what you're doing and gives us a higher chance of failure in the treatments. So as you see in the screen in front of you, your typical infection control, vascular status, debridement, negative pressure, dressing, surgery, if there's deformities, the way I like to put this is as follows. It's an analogy that I like to use with my own patients because some patients, no matter how educated they are, wound care is a little bit not your typical treatments because for example, with debridements, you know, patient thinks they're getting better and then you come in and you debride the wound and you're making it bigger and they're looking at you like, I, I thought it's getting smaller. Why are you making it bigger? So the analogy I use is basically considering like a grass or a garden in your backyard and you're trying to get the garden to grow, you want your grass to grow, you want your flowers to grow. And there's many integral parts to making that happen successfully. For example, you wanna get the weeds out. You wanna make sure that your sprinkler system's working well. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have the right nutrients for the garden. Um, and you see that play out with wounds as well. You know, your infection control would be similar to getting rid of weeds and bugs and infestation. Your vascular status is to have good watering system. You, the same way like you need to water the garden, you need blood and you need moisture to keep the, to keep the wound moist so that it doesn't dry out. You have a dry garden, grass is not gonna grow. 
you don't give the patient, the patient doesn't have the proper, um, they don't have the proper uh, deform, if they, have, they have, if they have deformities and your garden is like on a big slope, you know, the runoff is going to be different. And you have to know like how the, how the patient looks and what's going on inside. Do they have glucose control? Are they walking on the wound? All these things will help the patient. If you give them a good analogy to work with, then they can buy into the treatment. Um, today, we're going to really particularly focus on the negative pressure. We're assuming that they're, you know, you've checked the vascular status, they're on antibiotics appropriately, they're managing their weight, they're managing their diet, and you still have sometimes wounds that are complex, they won't heal, they're slow, they've had multiple surgeries, there's been a lot of compromise, there's insult to the skin, patients uh, have all different types of problems that even with the best of care, they may not get better and they may not respond well to the various treatments that one is doing. Negative pressure is an excellent modality and has been proven over and over in the literature as a method in order to help granulation tissue and to help speed up the skin healing over the granulation tissue. Most of the times we have on deep wounds, whether they're tunneling or they're just deep, is that you're looking at a lack of granulation tissue. If you don't have that granulation, granulation tissue, you can't get the subcutaneous tissue to grow and you can't get the dermal layer to close as well. Over the years, there's been various options in negative pressure. You have electronic, app, electronic powered option, you have the newer installation and dwell where it can wash out the wound while you're applying negative pressure. You also have mechanical powered where you don't have to be tethered to a wall with a wire. And then you have disposables as well um, for incision management system where you put negative pressure over incisions as a preemptive strike to prevent for wounds from dehissing and from incisional wounds dehissing. This is a very important slide that is worth reviewing over and over multiple times a year where you can understand what and how the negative pressure is working. There's two basic components to negative pressure that you're getting. There's the macro strain and the micro strain. The macro strain on a macro level, you're gonna draw the wound edges together. As well, it could draw out potentially infectious materials and it could draw out extra exudate. As well, because it's negative pressure, it reduces edema. When you have, when one of the major challenges in fighting wounds is increased edema, because when you have increased edema, so the pressure from the edema causes the wound to split apart and then doesn't allow for the edges to come together. So you always have to have in mind edema reduction. As well, it provokes it promotes perfusion. On a micro strain, you'll see in vitro studies showing that you'll get cell stretch, as well as in vitro and vivo studies showing that the foam contact with the tissue under negative pressure will cause a micro deformation that will lead to cell stretch. You see here in these animations, here is the foam, the black lines would be a cross section of the foam. And there's your granulation tissue on the bottom. And what you see is as the negative pressure applies, the granulation tissue slowly will inch up into those fibers of the foam and grow the tissue via the macro and micro strain. This will ultimately lead to building up granulation tissue that will get you to a point where either the skin can grow over it by itself or you can put over a skin graft on it because now you have healthy granulation tissue. I wanna focus on some cases of electric powered negative pressure wound therapy. We're talking about complex cases. Here's a 70 year old male, diabetic, smoker, many years, PVD, obese, had multiple attempts at wound closure by various plastic surgeons. You can see incision lines on the medial aspect of the ankle. And this is a very, very long standing 
wound for about 10 years. The patient was sent to me with the idea that if we can excise out the osteomyelitis that was in the joint and above the joint and just immobilize the ankle through an ankle fusion, the giving the wound a chance to heal. And that was what was presented to the patient. And the patient understood that these are limb salvage cases. It's very important to educate your patients and tell them that there's no guarantees with any of these cases. Although we use great techniques and proven techniques, but things can always go wrong. And this patient was already, he tried many things. So he was very on board with this. He liked the idea of aggressively cutting out any infected bone in the area, fusing the ankle so that the movement, there's no movement at the incision, at the wound site, and hopefully getting it closed. So the surgery that was chosen was an application of a multiplanar external fixator over a fusion site. The reason for this technique is that we did not want to introduce any hardware into the ankle. The patient already had infection that was going on for a long time. So we wanted to get attain our fusion via only external fixation that was temporary until the fusion was complete. And at the same time, we applied skin grafting, negative pressure, and you can see the negative pressure on the front and the side. So there's basically two negative pressure systems running at the same time, going off to separate units. The silver one was for the wound that we had the graft placed on. The one that you see on the lateral that's purple in nature, that's where the incision was. So you had a negative pre pressure that was placed over the incision to prevent, and this is also to prevent edema as well. One thing you can see here is that you have the ability to even go circumferentially with negative pressure around the ankle without causing any vascular risk. So here is a side view. One of the challenges when applying negative pressure with external fixation is that you have wires coming in and out of the foot and eventually one or two of them are gonna be exiting through the drape of the negative pressure, sometimes potentially through the foam. So you need to close down that draping and foam. You can apply more drape. Today we have some excellent draping systems and I like to use bone wax and you could apply bone wax directly over the wire um, to help get a seal. Dermatac would be a very good draping system as well to help get a seal on these types of uh, closures. So here you can see a little bit of a close-up of the bone wax that was exiting over the incision vac, and you can see even a little bit of blood buildup in the incision vac over there. Ultimately, everything went well, and here you can see after removal of one week, you have our grafting in place as well as the closure of the fusion site. It was a lateral approach used for that. Here we have two weeks later. And one of the important things here we see is minimal swelling. And here we can see the patient one year later, how it fully closed. The patient was on the vac for about eight weeks. At that time, you can see here that the skin closed and the patient, interesting story about this patient, as many of you have deal with patients, they sometimes disappear. We took off the external fixator and then he disappeared. I don't know where he went. And I happen to have been, need to be seen, see a patient at a nursing home and I'm going down the hallway and I all of a sudden see him there. And I'm like, oh my God, let me let me take a look at your foot. I gotta get a picture of it. Tell me how you're doing. And he was thrilled. It was fully closed. So the guy went through this for many years and had a full closure and was able to ambulate and did not have to have an amputation. Here's another example of using negative pressure over skin grafting. Um, this was a patient that had a calcaneal excision that with a posterior wound. Um, this is a pressure-induced wound that ended up developing exposed calcaneus that needed to be excised. So 
once again, we're looking to offload these patients. Um, this patient also needed another procedure that required an application of an external fixator. This is just, as we discussed, these are the more complex cases. These are not your typical cases. And you can see here um, from applying the negative pressure system and how it looks over the graft. So here's an interesting case I like to point out many times is that this patient had this wound for also about a year or so, had multiple treatments, see multiple doctors, and had all different applications of different therapies, even negative pressure therapy, and kept failing. And the reason for this was is because there was no x-rays done and the patient's deformity was not taken into consideration. As you can see here, a fully dislocated tail navicular joint where the talus was popping out. And you can see when the patient is fully weight bearing, the foot was rolling into a significant amount of valgus that that, was, that bone was what was popping out. And until this was fixed, then you can't fix the wound. So this person wasn't a question of a wound healing. It was a question of lack of recognition of deformity. Patient did ultimately have deformity correction with a reduction of the tail navicular joint via medial column beaming and ultimately healed very well. Here's a patient that you can see your classic diabetic ulcer, sub second metatarsal, been there for a long time, partially dislocated second metatarsal phalangeal joint, and patient also discussion with a necessity for reduction of that second metatarsal phalangeal joint, excision metatarsal head, as well as application of negative pressure therapy. And this patient healed very quickly as you can see three weeks out. Um, so a combination of recognizing underlying deformity and patient's nutritional status, patient's weight-bearing status, patient's social status, all will play a role into healing these wounds. Uh, very important to make sure to be aware of the patient's social status. Uh, certain times I've, I've had patients that I, I ask them, you know, where they live, who they live with, Sadly, I had a patient recently that, you know, that came with the daughter and the daughter says, yeah, we're taking care of them. We're taking care of them. And then I find out that, you know, the mom's living in, in, in the garage and uh, there are flies flying all around her and, you know, and eating away at the wound. Um, and, you know, it's a challenge without a doubt. And one has to realize that the social status plays a huge role in helping these wounds heal because, Many times they just really need to be in a nursing home versus another situation. A long-term long -term care acute facility could be the answer. Um, one has to realize that the what's best for the patient is a combination of recognizing their social status, nutritional status, ability to be non-weight bearing as well. Here we have a patient that had a transmetatarsal amputation and that the hist and we apply negative pressure therapy to it and it closes. And I like to use this case because when doing amputations, whether something as simple as a toe or something as big as an above knee, below knee amputation, one has to prep the patient that there's a potential for dehiscence. There's a potential for the need of negative pressure therapy. You may wanna think prior to the surgery, whether you wanna apply negative pressure over the incision. When you're dealt with a dehiscence such as this, you know, make sure quickly to go to negative pressure therapy. Don't let this sit around too long because timing is of essence. These things can turn to baloney amputations very fast. Too often doctors are jumping to baloney amputations um, without even giving these chances, these wounds a chance to heal. Moving along, we're now going to discuss mechanically powered disposable negative pressure therapy. The Advantages of mechanically powered exposure, negative pressure therapy is there are patients that have experience with negative pressure therapy. And the minute you tell them the word VAC, they cringe in horror and they're, they, they've had it before and they're, you know, very upset. And there's a psychological component that they don't even want to use it. 
and they don't want to use it because it makes noise, they're tethered to the wall, they can't live their life, which is all very important things because there are studies that show that patients that they are depressed um, when they have wounds is a higher, a higher incidence of that. And with that, there may not be as compliant, which may lead to further complications. And ultimately, many times people lead to limb loss because they don't want to utilize the therapy that's available to them. So the big advantage that we have with mechanical negative pressure therapy is that patients have the ability to use a device that's gonna apply negative pressure therapy without any electrical component without making noise, with a very comfortable silicone uh, drape, easy to apply, and allows the patient to be mobile and be able to live their life while they're healing. So here's a study of a patient that had a previous bunionectomy that developed Alex Varus. So she had came in from an outside institution, had the big toe dislocated, the second toe dislocated, uh, the third and fourth toe were bothering her, and she was wanted. She was in a lot of pain, couldn't get into shoes, couldn't live her life. And she understand. I explained to her that you know she had previous surgeries. There's a potential for incision issues, and the patient understood the risk benefits and wanted to go ahead with the procedure. So here you can see uh, before and after. This immediate post op. You see the incisions. Yeah, they're basically challenging because we try not to have to make too many incisions close to each other. Um, this particular case required this approach. And ultimately, I paid for it. <laughs> and you can see here that things healed a little bit, but there was a breakdown. And you could see at three and three and a half weeks, this eschar tissue building up over it and the area over the big toe, that eschar was mobile. And I discussed with the patient that, look, you have hardware in there. There's a potential it may need to come out. That fourth toe is not looking good. And let's just keep, keep a close eye on it. Let's not make any drastic moves over here. And let's see how it plays out a little bit. Because a lot of times these things will just fall off. The crust will fall off. You'll be looking at new skin. And many will look at that fourth toe on the right hand and left hand side picture and say, oh my God, that's gonna need an amputation. So take it easy, get her some wound care, apply proper local wound care and kind of wait around and see what's happening. So here we can see that that big toe incision is the eschar is kind of starting to fall off with exposed hardware. Uh, there are some uh, studies that show that there is no necessity to remove the exposed hardware immediately if it's stable and there's no loosening of the hardware. Uh, one can keep the exposed hardware there. Um, at this point, the decision was made to keep it there because she was healing well in the bone. Uh, the skin was what was taking its time to heal. At five weeks, um, we start seeing some demarcation and you can see some granulation tissue there. Here at six weeks, we start having, by the way, if you take a look at that fourth toe, it looks like a nice toe right now. And with that eschar that was there just kind of fell off. And here we could start seeing now, all right, we gotta make, we gotta make a move on this. We got a wound, we got the hardware, we got a fusion site, we're not in the clear yet. We wanna make sure that this patient gets this closed and gets her foot back. And, and that's, these are the complex cases there. You know, when we talk about complex cases, we're not talking about just a regular wound. We're talking about a wound with hardware that had multiple surgeries, you know, patients that have had, you know, issues in the past. Um, so basically at this point, the decision was made to remove the hardware and apply disposable mechanical power negative pressure therapy. So as we can see here, very easy to apply. Um, you have the ring that you apply around it that will create the seal and you cut the foam to place it over the wound. And there you can see the silicone dressing that gets applied on top of it. And here is your 
snap vac or ne mechanically powered negative pressure system. This takes me about 60 seconds or less to put on in the office. Patients love this. Uh, when they when I when I have to put on electrical powered ones, they're always telling me, "Oh, my my kitty cat that purrs is keeping me up at night." Um, because they make that noise when it's kind of like sucking down and there's no noise. This patient was very, very happy with her snapback. Um, during the process, she did develop an infection. As you can see here, there was swelling and she was treated appropriately with antibiotics. After the hardware was removed, you can see here now a gradual decrease of the size of the wound. And two and a half months later, and then this was a slow one, three months post-op. Here we go, three and a half months. And here it's closed four months later. I show you the x-rays so that you can know is that these don't always look pretty in the x-ray, but this patient is a very, very happy patient. She got to keep her toes, keep her feet, and was able to have the closed wound. And here we can see actually this patient has kept in touch with me. Um, from pre-op, sent me a picture at six months, and then one year post-op. And you can then, the reality is, is that it's those one year post-ops, as we saw earlier with that other fella that had the ankle repair, that how nicely it looks. Um, it never looks good while you're taking the extra, while you're taking the photos during the process. And that's where you have to be a good coach. And you're kind of coaching the patient along. Um, saying like, you know, if you stick with the plan, it should work out. So, you know, you can't give guarantees, but this is a great example of a complex case that healed up pretty well. Here's another patient that had a chronic wound on the lateral aspect of the ankle. He was a patient, also came from outside, had an ankle fusion elsewhere, um, needed a revision. The revision ended up to hissing. And here you can see had multiple debridements. This patient, sadly, he, he was sensate, so he felt a lot of this stuff and it was more, more challenging from his end. And even the vac was kind of uncomfortable. Usage of collagen ORC matrix with silver is helpful in this. You do the debridements and then we apply the disposable mechanically powered negative pressure system. And these were all used independently. They're not used at the same time. So here you could see how it's applied. We have our strip paste that's applied around it. We pack it with the foam, place over it the silicone layer with the drain, attach it to the negative pressure system that's mechanically powered. You can see how it's on the top of his leg. You can see all the scarring from the other surgeries that he's had. And very quickly, in two weeks, you can see a significant reduction in size. And here at four weeks, we're almost closed. And basically at six weeks, we got full closure and a very happy patient. I wanna thank you at this time for giving me the opportunity to give this discussion and also thank Ms. Weir for her insights on this regarding complex wounds and the application of negative pressure therapy. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.